So good morning, uh, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Environment and Resources Research uh, cluster uh, webinar, uh, a discussion with Janusz Pastor, Pathways for Governing Climate, Climate Engineering. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Neil Craik. I'm the co-lead of the research cluster and a faculty member uh, in the Vasily School of International Affairs and the School of Environment, Enterprise and Development uh, at the University of Waterloo. And so this is one of a series of, of, of talks that we're uh, giving to the to the research cluster uh, and to to others in, involving some of the issues that uh, we're interested in and are and are, are engaged in. Uh, before I turn it over to our guests, maybe I'll just do uh, uh, 30 seconds worth of, of, of framing about this this particular particular topic. The international, uh, the intergovernmental panel on climate change has really identified now uh, in its uh, 1.5 report uh, four distinct climate responses, and two of which we're quite familiar with: mitigation and adaptation. But in addition to those climate uh, responses, uh, the, the IPCC has also identified carbon removal and solar radiation modification uh, as other responses that we need to at least begin to understand and begin to start um, uh, considering. And each of these responses raises distinct governance issues. And I think solar uh, radiation modification in particular raises a sort of suite of uh, moral, scientific, uh, security, and environmental issues that make it a particularly uh, complex governance landscape. But I'd say increasingly, it, it's a conversation that, that, that cannot be put on the sidelines. Much of this uh, discussion uh, in the last really uh, 10 years uh, and maybe longer uh, has largely been in the sort of scientific academic NGO uh, community. But I think increasingly, uh, particularly in the last five years, there's been a recognition that states, international organizations and other global actors have to begin to in engage in, in, in this discussion. And this has really uh, been the, 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 the role of, of, of our guest, Janusz Pastor, uh, who's really been leading um, that global conversation uh, through his role uh, with the Carnegie, C Carnegie Council, where part of his mandate, as I'm sure he'll talk about, is to begin to engage uh, international decision makers and, and policy makers to begin considering uh, how we're going to think about climate uh, geoengineering governance and, and how, it, how it may proceed. And so today what we're going to do is we've asked uh, Janusz to provide some, 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 some comments uh, for us uh, for about uh, 20 minutes. He's going to give us a bit of background on, on his work and the sort of state of the uh, discussions uh, around these issues, I, uh, I think focusing on, on, on solar radiation modification. And then uh, I've asked my um, colleague uh, Juan Moreno Cruz, who's also an active researcher in, in this area, to provide uh, a, a few further, further comments and, and perspectives. We're hoping together that will take um, about uh, 25 or 30 minutes, uh, leaving us really a, a, a long time uh, for, for discussion. And so again, the, the intention is a discussion <laughs> with uh, Janusz Pastor and Juan, not, a, uh, not just a presentation. And so, you know, please um, be prepared to, to engage. And, and so before I turn it over, let me just uh, give a brief introduction to, 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 to both our speakers. And so Janusz Pastor, uh, his current role is a senior fellow in the Carnegie uh, Council for Ethics and International Affairs, and he's the executive director of the Carnegie Climate Governance Initiative, C2G, which if you haven't been to their website, but you're interested in, you should, because it's certainly one of the most informative um, sources of information on, on, on this topic. Janice has a long uh, history um, and, and experience in, in working in, in, in these areas. Uh, prior to this assignment, he was the UN Assistant Secretary General for Climate Change in New York. Um, and before that, he's held a number of positions in, in different uh, NGOs and, and, and IOs, um, including, interestingly, he was the Executive Secretary for the UN Secretary General's High Level Panel on Global Sustainability. And I mentioned that 
uh, just to point out that Yanis has an existing relationship with the Balsili School because Jim Balsili uh, was a member of the of of the high panel, and 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 uh, and I uh, presume um, that they're well acquainted with each other through that through that uh, uh, process. Uh, one uh, will be known to to, to, to to many of you. He's a colleague of, of mine at the School of Environment, Enterprise and Development, where he holds the Canada Research Chair in Energy uh, Transitions, uh, once being uh, with UW for, I think, for the last couple of years. But before that, he was at the uh, uh, Georgia, Georgia Tech. Juan's an economist by, by training, does much of of his research in energy systems, uh, technology and climate policy in the interface. And in that capacity, he's been very uh, active, both in the sort of economics of, of um, climate engineering, but also I think the sort of governance implications. And so uh, with that, I'll turn it over uh, to you, Yanish, and we'll, we'll, we'll get on with the show. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Neil, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this. Uh, uh, I hope my slide is coming through. It is. Yeah. Good. Okay. Perfect. So um, I'd like to share with you a few thoughts uh, about this uh, complicated and often very challenging and controversial issue. And I'll do that very much based on our experience at the Carnegie Climate Governance Initiative. Uh, so everything I'll say is really based on our, our work. and. Uh, uh, very simply, uh, what I plan to do is to just say a few words about why we need to talk about these approaches at all. Uh, then a few words about who we are, because it's good to understand uh, the, the context from which this is all coming. And then I'd like to go through a few examples of how we addressed these issues in different intergovernmental processes. Now, uh, I did not make a distinction uh, uh, whether it was because some of these activities related to carbon dioxide removal only others to solar radiation modification uh, and while recognizing that there are some huge differences in the governance of these uh, I will say uh, you know every time when we get to something where it's specifically one or the other so uh, with that uh, just a few words about uh, uh, carbon the Carnegie climate governance initiative we are a small uh, initiative, just a few people, but we're working in three continents and uh, our mission is very simple, is to get these issues uh, uh, to, to, to contribute to the development of effective governance for these uh, emerging approaches, in particular solar radiation modification and large-scale carbon dioxide removal. And uh, our strategy is to raise awareness, to encourage learning, and then eventually work with partners to catalyze th that, th that these issues get put on the agenda of either key intergovernmental or other, uh, uh, intergover other international processes. We are impartial in doing this, especially when it comes to uh, uh, whether or not these approaches, technologies should be used. Uh, that's not our business. Uh, what we're, uh, and we're not an advocacy organization for particular solutions. Uh, and we're also time limited, which is important uh, that we hope to finish our work by 2023 and then we will, uh, we will finish that. So, um, a few words about why we need to talk about this. Uh, I think the most, imp Neil, you started uh, the introduction with that. And, uh, we're in actually a deep crisis, uh, a climate crisis. The impacts are everywhere, forests are burning, uh, and the global emissions are not coming down. And I'm not talking about the last few months because of COVID, I'm talking about overall the global emissions. And it's pretty clear that the Paris ambition is not enough. And, and worse, the current geopolitical context is not very helpful either. Uh, so uh, the bottom line is that uh, emission reductions alone are clearly insufficient uh, to reach our goal of 1.5 degree, and uh, uh, that's, that's the bottom line. Then the question is what else, in addition to emission reductions, we need? And that's where we need to talk about these new approaches, these new techniques, because some of these will take quite a bit of time, and even if they may need to be used in a few decades from now, we will need time uh, to uh, develop them. Uh, just very briefly, uh, you may have seen this graph in, in many different contexts, it's, but it's, it's actually important to look at this in totality. 
uh, you have climate impacts on the y-axis and time on the x-axis without any numbers, and that's important. So it's a qualitative graph. But the point is that as emissions continue to uh, rise or not go down, the impacts are growing. And we need to cut emissions aggressively to bring them down. And uh, uh, what is also clear now is that we need to do more than that. We also have to remove carbon. But many scientists are saying that in order to avoid the overshoot in temperature and maybe other climate impacts, uh, one way to do it is to make use of solar radiation modification or SRM. And then uh, uh, we will not have the overshoot and have time to do the full decarbonization that we need. So this is a sort of a simple picture of uh, the overall scene. Now, I'm not going to talk too much about the different approaches, the different technologies, because this, this discussion is mostly about governance. But if you have questions later, we can go into some of these. But it's important to talk a little bit about terminology, because everybody is using different words and different phrases. Now, uh, I use the, the, the term climate altering approach in the title of this uh, presentation. Uh, but that is the same as others call it geoengineering, some call it climate intervention, and some call it climate engineering. What is significant in all of these, the intentionality and the large scale, large scale in the sense of having an impact on the climate. Uh, and of course, within these, we have carbon dioxide removal, some call that greenhouse gas removal. And uh, uh, Neil, you mentioned about mitigation, but in fact, mitigation, according to the IPCC, and the UNFCCC includes carbon dioxide removal as well. So uh, it includes emission reduction and carbon removal. And then we have the most challenging and most controversial one of all solar radiation modification or solar geoengineering, or some people just call that geoengineering itself. So uh, one just needs to be clear uh, which uh, terminology uh, we're using for what. And governance is a particularly important one in this context. And I, I will just go a little bit, uh, a little bit more in detail, not too much. We have a, an infographic on this, which you can see from on our website if you're interested. But the point I'd like to make is that governance is not equal to simply governments doing something like regulation. Governance is a much broader concept. Indeed, the IPCC defines it as a much broader concept where different actors, civil society, academia, business, uh, and also government uh, work in different ways uh, to understand uh, an approach, a technology, uh, on, uh, on choices. And yes, it also can include uh, uh, relevant uh, regulation as it is needed. So when we talk about governance, we talk about this broader approach. Uh, there are many, many approaches and technologies, and we will definitely not go into the detail, but just to give you a sense, on the top right-hand corner of this uh, infographic, you see that the solar technologies, uh, uh, particularly uh, uh, at one end, the stratospheric aerosol injection that reflects sunlight back into space and thereby cools the planet. And then at the other end, you have solar uh, surface albedo modifications like painting roofs white or changing plants that have a different albedo, which again changes the reflectivity. At the other end, uh, the bottom left uh, and the center, you have the various carbon removal methods that include nature-based approaches, technology-based approaches, and mixed hybrid approaches, some on land and some on the ocean. Uh, and uh, just another way to look at it in a very simplistic way, you have your two major families, the carbon dioxide removal, the nature-based, technology-based, and the hybrid options, and the solar radiation modification, which also includes uh, a number of different groups of uh, techniques and technologies, such as local radiation modification, marine cloud brightening, and stratospheric aerosol injection. Now, uh, the, but the purpose of this discussion is not so much to go into the technology, is, is just to look at how we have tried to make it work with different intergovernmental processes. And what I'll, I'll try to do is run through, uh, what is it, two, four, six examples, uh, starting with the Convention on Biological Diversity, then the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, and uh, then the UN Environment Program and its governing body, the UN Environment Assembly. Then a couple of words about the United Nations as a whole, including the UN Security Council and the UN General Assembly. These are areas where either we have already worked or we plan to work 
uh, in the near future. And that shows a little bit the, the, the breadth and depth of engagement one needs to do on government governance. So let's start with the Convention on Biological Diversity. This was pretty key for us from the very beginning because uh, the, the convention, the CBD, actually had a key decision on the governance of what they called geoengineering, and they really included uh, both removals and solar uh, activities in that. Back in 2010, which was then uh, uh, reaffirmed in 2016, but the way we got into this, other than taking note of the decision, uh, is that uh, when they said we need transdisciplinary research, they didn't make it clear what, what was the content of that. So we decided to organize a few workshops with, uh, with uh, uh, government representatives, parties to the CBD, uh, some scientists, some civil society organizations, and out of this came a policy paper on a possible research program on geoengineering. And uh, that was then submitted to the um, CBD process and it was taken note of, but it was, it didn't go much, much further. But this was one of our early engagements and this is about providing policy guidance to the research community of what areas of research may be needed. Then the next one I'd like to talk about is the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And uh, the UNFCCC has a clear mandate for removals. As I mentioned before, it has always been part of it. Mitigation was always defined as emission reductions and removals. What is new is, uh, especially since the Paris Agreement, that uh, very likely very large scale removal needs to take place. And in the early period in the UNFCCC, removals were much more, much smaller quantities and relevant only for a few countries. Now, uh, in the new situation, this might involve a lot more countries. And uh, uh, it's very clear also that as, as many countries are preparing their mid-century goals uh, toward net zero emissions, that uh, in, in many cases, quite substantial amounts of carbon dioxide removal will need to be used in order to reach those goals. So the, the UNFCCC COPs are also the conference of the parties meetings are also the most important global meeting of this kind and it offers opportunities to engage with many, many different actors. So what we've done in the UNFCCC process is a whole series of side events, bilateral meetings, which enrich our ideas of what needs to be done, what can be done. We've been in very close cooperation with the UNFC secretariat and very importantly, we we commissioned a paper on what we felt were the governance gaps on uh, the um, on the um, uh, in the area of carbon dioxide removal, and uh, that, with that we've been discussing with many countries, uh, many government representatives uh, of what those gaps are, and out of those discussions arose an idea that is currently under discussion that there may need to be a an informal forum where governments can come together to discuss their practical experiences of how they do carbon dioxide removal. And so we're currently discussing this with a number of countries and it, it looks very positive that there, there is interest in having an informal exchange of views about uh, these kinds of issues. So that's been very much our focus in the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. We have not considered doing anything on solar radiation modification in the UNFCCC context, partly because uh, there is a debate about that, but many, many feel that the UNFCCC, uh, neither legally nor otherwise, is the most appropriate forum for uh, considering solar radiation modification. And while that can be discussed at a practical level, we felt that uh, even if it's relevant, it is not the most important, the most significant issue currently. Uh, the next one, and this is perhaps our most significant work so far, is what has happened with the UN Environment Assembly and the UN Environment Program. Uh, early on in our work, we have identified that UNEP uh, and its governing body, UNEA, are key. Why? Because they are not the number one mandate of UNEP is to bring uh, to the attention of governments the environment, the impacts on the environment of new emerging issues, technologies, processes and, and so on. And clearly these uh, 
uh, approaches, whether it's the carbon dioxide removal or the solar radiation modification, they are new, they are, and they will have substantial impacts, some positive and some negative. So clearly we felt that that was something we had to focus on. And that's then we, we ended up in a very detailed engagement with the uh, executive director of UNEP, with the senior staff, then we uh, had briefings to the ambassadors to the UN Environment Program in Nairobi, workshops and so on. And what came out of all these discussions is an idea, a general idea, that it may be useful for the UN Environment Assembly at its fourth session to consider some kind of resolution on the topic, on the topic of the governance of geoengineering. And uh, uh, in these discussions, one country, in this case it was Switzerland, picked up the idea and they said, we will do this. And they then took on this idea and they submitted a resolution together with a number of countries, uh, which uh, requested essentially an assessment of these uh, technologies and these approaches, what is the science, the risks, the benefits, and what are the governance challenges. Uh, the resolution had a very difficult uh, week of negotiations and it was not possible to reach consensus, it was withdrawn. Yet, we look at this as a hugely successful activity. Uh, first of all, we managed to catalyze that it ended up being on the agenda, which is very much our approach. We are not an advocacy uh, organization, so we are not pushing for this or that outcome. We just wanted to make sure that it is on the agenda, and it was. Uh, we managed to catalyze with this a, a very substantial intra and intergovernmental discussion, uh, uh, which is still continuing. And what's interesting is not only it, it's, it was there at UNEA 4, but it is still there. And now governments, without our involvement, which is the perfect example of catalytic uh, role, they are engaging with each other to see what they're going to do for the next UN Environment Assembly, which will be held in March of 2021. Uh, moving on, uh, and I'll try to speed up a little bit, uh, the United Nations, we've always felt that the UN Secretary General would have an important role, so we've engaged with the office, and that's easy because some of us, like myself, I've worked there uh, in the past, but also we felt the diplomatic community in New York would be important, particularly uh, in view of an eventual engagement of the UN General Assembly. We've also engaged very seriously with the regional economic commissions of the UN uh, in uh, four key regions, Africa, Latin America, Asia, and in, the, uh, in West Asia. So uh, some, signif oh, sorry. Uh, some significant outcomes of this is that we actually managed to catalyze a, a meeting chaired by the Secretary General uh, on uh, bringing together the heads of key UN entities to discuss the issue of the governance of climate altering technologies. And uh, uh, that was the first time that ever happened something like that. Uh, we've also had a number of very, you know, bilateral and what I would call minilateral meetings in, in New York and uh, a series of activities with the regional commissions in a way that, for example, in the Latin American economic culture, they have taken this on and now they're doing things uh, based on discussions we had without us having to be involved too much. So this is, this is all actually moving very nicely according to what we were hoping to achieve. And uh, I should mention here that one of our ideas, because we want to close our uh, initiative by 2023, is that we plan to transition some of some or all of our activities into some UN entities, one or more UN entities, and we've started discussing that with a number of executive heads of different UN bodies. The UN Security Council, this is an important one, particularly when it comes to solar radiation modification. And uh, I won't go into the long story, but just to say that one country, in this case Belgium, uh, who, was, who is member of the Security Council this year, wanted to organize a major event in New York on uh, the geopolitical and security implications of solar radiation modification. We've been involved, they've asked us for views and advice, and we've worked with them to prepare a major event in the United Nations, which of course was uh, uh, postponed indefinitely uh, because of COVID-19. So we kind of lost momentum there, but it would have been uh, this would have been a meeting in March, and it would have been a very important uh, uh, part of our strategy to reach out to the New York diplomatic community. Uh, uh, that's not lost. It will happen again. 
but uh, there are some very important geopolitical and security implications of solar radiation modification. And uh, that needs to be considered in this uh, kind of a space. And we'll uh, probably come to that in the discussion. Uh, and then the last example is the UN General Assembly. And, and I, I kept it last because that's in a sense our, our final specific uh, uh, strategic objective. Uh, and this is very much related to solar radiation modification and in particular stratospheric aerosol injection. If ever the world community were to address uh, uh, so stratospheric aerosol injection, that would be the most global action uh, that endeavor that the international community would have ever undertaken. And uh, since everybody would be infected, since the one global atmosphere would be impacted, it is important that at some point there will also, there also be a discussion in the one global forum where every country has a voice, and that's the UN General Assembly. Uh, now, we know that the IPCC will have its next assessment report out in 2022. So our strategy is, and we know that there will be quite a bit of new information on solar radiation modification in that report. So we're trying to contribute to getting countries ready to be able to address the implications. And one of those is that uh, these issues would need to be also addressed in the UN General Assembly. Uh, we would like to catalyze very much something like uh, what we uh, did for the UN Environment Assembly. And uh, my last slide, uh, just uh, a couple of points to, to bring this all to, to, together. So uh, the first point is that we have to recognize that emission reductions alone is insufficient to address the climate crisis. But in order to see what else we need, we need to better understand these uh, removal and solar radiation modification approaches. And uh, while the governance of each of these are quite different, uh, not just the two families, but even within those families of the different techniques uh, that are being practiced, at some point when it comes to choices about these, societies need to bring these together in a comprehensive risk management framework. Uh, for all climate response, including emission reductions, adaptation, removal, solar radiation modification, and in a way that it links to sustainable development goals. And that, of course, takes us to a, 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 an approach, some people call it earth system governance, uh, whatever you call it, but it's the kind of interlinked policies uh, that we need to move toward, and we are pretty far from that at the overall level. So with that, thank you very much. And I look forward to Juan's comments and, uh, and your difficult questions. That's great. Thank you uh, so much uh, for, for that, Janos. That was a really nice uh, tour de raison of uh, what uh, C2G has been doing and I think some of the major governance initiatives around this. Uh, before I turn it over to um, Juan, I thought maybe I would just um, mention how we're going to do uh, the, the, the Q&A so people can begin to um, think about questions and, and even input them. And so you'll see that there's a, a, a Q&A tab um, in, your, um, in your Zoom screen and you can type in questions there. You're free to type in a whole question. You're also free just to type, you know, I have a question uh, and uh, when we move to that session, then you know we'll just call on you. We can un un unmute your microphone, and and then we can engage in a bit, a bit more of a discussion uh, with everyone. And so while Juan's giving his comments, uh, feel free to uh, begin thinking uh, about some some areas that we might uh, want to have some discussions in. And so with that, uh, I'll turn it back uh, uh, to you, uh, Juan, for a few more few more comments. Uh, thank you, and thank you, Janos, for your presentation. It is I always learn something new. Um, what I am going to do is kind of frame the questions uh, that I want to ask um, with a little bit of uh, explanation as to why I'm asking them. Um, I started to work on this several years ago, like for my PhD, and um, and at the time this looked solar engineering, I'm focusing my comments only on solar engineering, look like a very crazy technology. Uh, and the reason I started to study it was because I thought it was fun without thinking that um, 
it was going to be necessary. But two years after that came the realization from a series of papers uh, that we really were in trouble and that the carbon that was already in the atmosphere was going to stay there for a long time. So uh, geoengineering, solar geoengineering, uh, became um, an important aspect of my research going forward because I think actually it is important that we discuss it. Uh, the technology as originally uh, conceived um, was uh, a global intervention on the uh, climate, but this means uh, a coordinated effort to reduce temperatures. Um, since then, the the research has moved on to a, to a more disaggregated view of looking at these technologies. There is not one, it's not a monolithic, there are many possible interventions. And these many possible interventions can be done by one or several countries. It's not necessarily going to be a coordinated effort. And that has become, in my perspective, from my perspective, one of the biggest challenges in the governance of geoengineering, solar geoengineering. So um, the characteristics that I see in solar engineering that makes them different uh, is that it is cheap or doesn't cost much. It is fast. That means we see the effects uh, quickly. And it's very imperfect in the way it compensates for climate. And the combination of those three um, uh, characteristics actually make it for a very, very different monster. We are usually um, a, bound to, to techniques to fight climate change that are actually costly. They take a while to deploy and to see effects and in principle compensate perfectly for the environment. I'm talking about mitigation, which as Janos said, includes uh, carbon dioxide removal. So geoengineering is very different from an from a, a economic perspective and also from a governance perspective. So one of the differences is that um, we usually think of uh, a governance a structure for climate change as one that uh, invites people to cooperate. So the default position from countries is that we don't want to do anything because we want everybody else to, to, to do the job for us. That's what we call free, uh, free writing. And, and that has been the main problem on, on climate negotiations from my a narrow perspective as an economist. Uh, but geoengineering flips that. For solar geoengineering, actually, the question is, how do, we, how, how do we ensure that actually the decision to implement geoengineering, because it's so cheap and so fast, has um, the approval for at least a majority of countries? So now we're thinking of a governance, a set of governance institutions that are trying to uh, foster collaboration, but, but by minimizing or deterring exclusion. And I think those are very different um, institutions. Um, Janos mentioned at the end, the one before that, that uh, the Security Council could be a way to look at this, and, and I'm in complete agreement. I think um, solar geoengineering is more attuned or more similar to something like international military power than it is to, to a traditional climate technology. So not because necessarily because of uh, military um, uh, applications of the technology, just because of the structure of the, of the incentives problem. Um, the other thing that I had come to realize is that, um, and, and some recent development can point to this, is that the idea that the governance and the, and the introduction of the engine is going to be coordinated is not as clear anymore. Uh, we have post-structural doing experiments or proposing experiments on their own cause in which they combine a little bit of carbon dioxide removal with a little bit of uh, marine cloud brining, brining. And because it's in their coast and it's within, within their sovereignty, then they don't need to include anybody else. Um, but it does have global implications. So anything that is large enough to alter the climate of a country is going to be large enough to alter the climate overall. So how do we deal with this idea that um, single countries can, can do this? So how do we move from, from the notion of a global uh, governance effort in a way in which actually we can control for this 
minilateral efforts that might show up. Um, I, the last point that I really want to make is the difference between research and deployment of solar geoengineering. Currently, I'm working with the uh, National Academy of uh, Sciences on, the, on a report on the governance of research. And, and we have been very careful not to mention anything about deployment, but it has been very difficult to do that because these geoengineering technologies to be tested uh, have to be at some point in time deployed and uh, defining the difference between research and deployment uh, is going to be difficult. So I, I guess I'm closing with this uh, point but asking one particular question um, and it is how do we ensure that the governance mechanisms that we're putting in place are not hindering the possibility of a, of a geo, solar engineering program moving forward. At this point, I'm more worried, um, given the dire uh, situation with the climate, that we might not deploy it when we have to. I'm more worried about that than the fact that we could deploy, deploy it when we don't need it. So those are my comments, and, and uh, I hope they are informative. Thanks, Janice, again. Thank you uh, so much, Juan. That was uh, a really nice um, and concise way of, of, of capturing some of the, the, the key divisions and way we might uh, begin to, to, to think about uh, the governance uh, uh, issue. Uh, I think at this stage, I'm going to um, turn it over to, to, to my colleague and the co-lead of the Environment Resources Research Cluster, uh, Deborah Van Nynaten, uh, and we'll just um, you know start some of the, the some of the discussion. So over over to you, Deb. Okay, well, thank you. We already have two questions that have been posted in the Q&A, but I'm, I'm going to uh, sort of unmute uh, those asking questions so that you can ask, ask the question yourself. So let me first un unmute uh, one of our Balsley School faculty, uh, Vanessa Schweitzer. Vanessa, do you want to ask your question? Thank you, Deborah. Um, so I ended up posting a second question while you were calling on my first okay, question. That's great. I'm, not I'm not sure if they're related, so maybe I'll go ahead and just pitch both of them right now. Um, the first uh, was uh, actually to uh, Janish asking for uh, clarification on what counter geoengineering is. He mentioned that on one of his, I saw it on, written on the slide, but that he didn't really talk about it. So I was wondering a bit more about what that is and the scenarios under which it might arise. Um, and what's sort of related uh, is this question of how does one tell whether we're talking about a global governance structure or even an individual country, how does one tell when you quote unquote have to deploy SRM? Oh, I think you're muted there. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So well, thank you, Vanessa. The, 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 first of all, the, the counter geoengineering. So that, again, be clear, counter geoengineering usually refers to counter solar geoengineering, but uh, maybe it can be used in other contexts as well. Uh, the idea is that not everybody may be interested in, in uh, cooling the planet. Uh, you know, for example, there are quite a few countries in the north, who shall remain unnamed, of course, who are quite happy to see the ice melting because they can get to the gas and they can get transport uh, across the northern route and things like that. So maybe if you were to do a situation like Juan started describing that you could have a unilateral uh, decision to deploy, uh, because some country or some few countries decide it's so important, some other countries say, no, 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 we disagree. And since there was no discussion and no agreement, uh, you might start spraying aerosols into the stratosphere and another country might start spraying gases that do the opposite. And, and you end up in, a, in what is referred to as a counter geoengineering scenario. Clearly something you, you would want to avoid. So, uh, but, but that's, that's what it is. And uh, uh, that's why it is so important to have 
discussions about how decisions will be made about these uh, technologies. And, and, you know, Juan is absolutely right that it is not the ideal one could think of, certainly from a certain perspective, is that countries will come together and they look at the situation and they decide to do something together or not do something together. And then, and then uh, everything is wonderful. That's not the way our imperfect world uh, operates. And uh, what is probably more likely scenario is that one or two countries decide something has to be done. And some even might just simply go ahead and do it. And then, then you have all these different challenges. Now, uh, it, this leads to the second question, Vanessa, that you had. And to me, uh, when to deploy SRM uh, is one of the questions that, that are the most difficult and the most challenging questions that we're facing in terms of governance of these emerging approaches to altering the climate. Because let's assume that stratospheric aerosol injection is the one that we're talking about, that, that part of solar geoengineering. And uh, however it is done, whether it's done by one country or a few countries or by unilateral action by a, a billionaire, uh, however it is done, it will have an impact on the globe. Okay, so, so and it will have important, significant impacts on the globe, uh, hopefully a positive impact of re reducing the temperatures, but it can have negative impacts in terms of the local climates that will be produced. Because let's not forget, there's a, a lot of people are talking about climate restoration these days. You can't restore the climate. You can restore maybe a temperature, maybe, <laughs> but you cannot restore the climate. So even if the temperature comes down, maybe climates in one part of the world or somewhere else will turn out different. Now, many papers have shown that, in fact, most people might be better off uh, than worse off <laughs> in a stratospheric aerosol ejection scenario. But you know, if 5% if of 10 billion people are, are worse off, that's a lot of people. <laughs> so you, you have to think about uh, uh, the, the impacts on all those people. And then the question at the beginning, so where can one have a discussion of at what point, if ever, should uh, the, the international community think about saying, yes, we need to do solar radiation modification. Now, some scientists are saying it's already too late. <laughs> to, to, we should already decide that now because it takes 10, 15 years of research before we even get to the point where we know that this technology would be feasible. Uh, so uh, some people are saying that. Now, is that true? That depends on how you interpret risks. So it's very complicated. And that's why from our perspective at the Carnegie uh, Council, what we've been saying is it's so important to have, to encourage conversations, conversations within and between countries about what these approaches are, what are the risks, what are the benefits, and what are the governance challenges, so that we begin to be prepared to, to actually answer that difficult question that you asked. When can we decide whether uh, to deploy SRM? And, uh, but even before that, should we ever decide to deploy SRM uh, or not? And if we decide, how do we do it? That's where Juan's question comes in about the inclusive or exclusive uh, governance. Uh, but we can decide, no, we don't want to do it. And then there are implications. And we also have to deal with that. So very complicated. Uh, sorry that there is no easy answer to your question. But I think that's part of the challenge we're facing. And that's why this is so controversial, this topic. Thank you. I think that actually leads really nice. I'm oh, sorry, Juan. Go ahead. Sorry. I, I want to to add something to the to the two questions. I wrote a, a paper early this year with Daniel Hayen at ETH on counter geoengineering. And the reason we thought about that was because uh, we, we were thinking of, um, of the nuclear framework in which you have a deterrence mechanism that you, to avoid people to blow up a nuclear uh, bomb, then you build nuclear bomb. And we said, okay, what happens if you have something like that for your engineering, which you, you actually develop a technology that you say, if you do your engineering, I am going to stop you from doing it. And there are two ways to do that. One is if you, if you let's say, cool down half a degree, I'm going to warm it up for, 100, for, for half a degree. But there is another worse one in which 
if you do a little bit, I'm just automatically going to deploy something that the curing tool be is a kind of like a nuclear winter. And we thought, okay, so now we have an instrument that kind of get us closer to this nuclear deterrence uh, structure. But what we found is that in this case, you might end up in two possible extreme situations. One, in which you end up doing geoengineering, counter geoengineering, because everybody is doing whatever they want, and that is obviously terrible. Um, and another one in which you uh, decide not to deploy geoengineering, but with the possibility that deploying was making people better off. So you might end up in a non-deployment scenario, even though you could be better off by deploying. And this leads to the, to the second question then. In the second question, and obviously, please keep in mind that these are purely theoretical exercises, things that we just think about while grabbing a beer. But, uh, but it leads to a really important question, and it, and it is how do we know that we need to deploy this? And the, um, the first clarifying point that I'm, I'm going to say is that we need to deploy. I meant I, that was purely worded. I mean, how do we know what worries me is that we might not be ready. Um, and, by, and by this, I mean, we should be talking, we should be doing research on this. Um, because uh, if somebody were to deploy or decided that this is the right time to deploy, we as a community in terms of governance and science, we need to be prepared with answers. We need to say, if you deploy, these are the consequences of the point. So that's what I mean of being late. Like somebody, we, we are not doing enough research. We are not embarking on this because we are scared that we're gonna end up in a slippery slope that leads us to, to actual deployment. But what I'm worried about is that we are not doing enough so that we are able to provide answers when the situation is, is needed. So just to clarify my position and to, and to add a little bit to, to Janusz Kuras. This discussion, I think, leads very nicely into a question that was posted about governance gaps. And I just wonder if the person that posted that, I'm sorry, it's, it's uh, Gao X, um, wanted to ask a question. And so I, I've unmuted you if you want to go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, this is from Canada. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yes. Uh, well, first of all, I just want to thank Janos for, for that excellent presentation and as well as the work that performed by you and your team at C2G. It must be fairly complex to work with so many countries as well as with the multinational uh, bodies. I'm just wondering, I really like this slide that you had on governance. It uh, shows the broad scope and the various groups involved. I'm wondering if uh, you could just elaborate on a little bit more about what you see the governance gaps in relation to the various many aspects and from there why so critical for countries to work together. I think you did touch on that a little bit from solar radiation management angle but I would just frame my question from CDR perspective. Thank you. Okay all right so from, from, from the carbon removal perspective, uh, I think that's a simpler one, partly because we actually have institutions, international, in, well, first of all, most of the governance relation, in relation to carbon dioxide removal will actually have to take place at the national level, at the domestic level. There are some gaps at the international level, and these are the ones I will be focusing on now. And we're lucky in the sense that there are institutions, international institutions that currently have in their mandate to deal with these issues. So it's, we don't have to start from scratch. We can look at particular institutions and say within that context, what else is missing? So for example, we commissioned a paper two years ago, which we're currently updating, uh, on the governance gaps in the UNFCCC process in relation to carbon removal. Very concrete. And uh, uh, in that, we have found basically a family of three sets of governance gaps that we need to think about. The first one is accounting, uh, measuring, reporting, and verifying. What do you mean by a ton of carbon? What do you mean by carbon neutrality? What do you mean by climate neutrality? And we're seeing this happen everywhere, especially now that countries are signing up to 
2050 net zero pledges, but it's not clear what it is. Some say net zero carbon, some net zero climate, uh, and even if it's both climate, we don't quite know what is a ton of a carbon. So th there's a whole series of issues here. And while there are accounting systems in the UNFCCC frameworks, our analysis shows that they are not robust enough to, to deal with the large scale uh, carbon removal that we need to do. The second set, and that's an interesting one, is it relates to a little bit responsibilities. Who is responsible for carbon removal? Who should do it? Uh, uh, and, and if yes, who, who should pay for it? Because at the moment, removing carbon is expensive. And uh, even if it gets cheaper, it's still extra money that somebody has to come up with. And so how do you fund it? Is it carbon taxes? Is it the legislation? Is the private sector somehow going to magically pay for it? These are important questions, but related to it, how do you organize technical cooperation between countries? Uh, because there may be some countries, let's say in the global south, that might be interested, but they may not have the resources, the technology, and so on. And related to this, also an important governance gap is liability. What if something goes wrong? Uh, just last week, there was a very interesting article in the New York Times talking about the wildfires in California, uh, which of course are exacerbated by climate change. But that specific thing that was interesting is they talked about a specific forest that was set up by the state of California to offset its emissions. And that burnt. So it's gone. <laughs> so, you know, you, you invested in something and, and then it just goes up in smoke. So there is a liability issue of how do you organize for that? And then the third set of issues on governance it relates to linkages. And most of the carbon removal activities will have impacts on land, on the ocean, on, uh, uh, for example, if it's land forest based and food security issues. So there are many linkages to different sustainable development goals, which tend to be governed by different intergovernmental entities at the international level. Uh, some uh, treaty based like the Convention on Biological Diversity or the Desertification Convention, others like the FAO, uh, their uh, soft law, but they also have their own treaties as well. So there, there's a combination. And right now there is a lot of lip service play, paid to how governments are going to work together. But unfortunately, it is mostly nice words, but not enough real concrete connections. So how does one take care of these synergies in a way that the synergies are maximized and the trade-offs are minimized? So that would be the, the answer on, on CDR. But, but I, I think at some point, and uh, uh, Neil and Deborah, you tell me when, <laughs> but uh, the, the, we, we just barely started talking about some of the governance challenges of SRM. I think they are much bigger and much more challenging than the ones I mentioned. So we could go into that now or maybe at some later stage. Well, I would say, why don't you give us a, a little intro there? And I, I see Juan shaking his head and, and mm -hmm. sort of nodding, and I'm sure he's got something to say there too. Okay. So I, right. I would invite you both. So, so let, let me start, and I'm sure Juan has some, some useful ideas here because he's been also working on this. But as a start, as opposed to carbon removal, in the case of solar radiation modification, we do not have an obvious place where even a discussion can start. It, it doesn't exist. So, so uh, you know, you, you, you asked Vanessa, you know, when are we ready to deploy, when can we decide to, to whether we can deploy SRM? We, we don't even know where to discuss these issues. So that's the number one governance issue is what is the forum? What is the place where these discussions can start? Now, the UN Environment Assembly sort of started that uh, in the context of this decision that was there two years ago. And uh, uh, the IPCC report will also encourage that, but, but that's the number one. Number two is uh, how to set up some kind of a governance framework where, where there can be a kind of a logical process of, hmm, we have a problem. We may need solar radiation modification as one of the tools in the toolbox how much research, what kind of research do we need to do in order to get to a point where we know enough <laughs> that we could say, yes, we need it for sure. And yes, we are able to do it. We don't have anything like that. So how can the international community guide research in a way 
And, and that's a very important part of governance. And then once we get there and we still think that we may need this, then comes the hard part. How does one decide, uh, at least in, a, in an ideal world, of how the 194, 195 countries and maybe other territories come together to make some decision, some shared decision on whether or not to proceed and how to proceed. And, and this is all, these are thoughts about a, an ideal process, but as I totally agree with Juan that it's very unlikely that that's the way it's gonna go. But then, you know, how does the international community react and prepare for a unilateral decision? How does the Security Council, which deals with global security, address the issue if country X or country X, Y, and Z get together and say, we're going to do this? They're not breaking any law. There's no international law that says you can't do it. So again, the Security Council needs to either do some preparatory thinking of what they do to avoid this or to be ready to, to say, what will they do if it happens? So these are the kinds of governance issues that are so, so difficult and so unusual in the way we operate in the world. And that's why we, we believe that it is so important to have conversations about it from different perspectives, different stakeholders, so that slowly uh, we get a little bit more answers of what actually might be the options to move forward. Okay. Yeah, so, so I want to say that once we get there, then we have the issues that, that Janus brought up for CDR. Then we have to think about liability and accounting and all this stuff. So, so that's why CR, SRM or solar geoengineering is clearly a larger issue because whatever governance issues you, we have for CDR, they come after we have even decided how to think about the problem. And, uh, and we really don't know, and I think we don't know because we, we haven't been exposed to a problem or, or to a, a technique like geoengineering ever. I, I, like, I think many of us have thought of uh, what else looks like this? What else have we done that actually looks like solar geoengineering? And, and we can say, well, it looks a little bit like CDR. Oh, it looks a little bit like nuclear proliferation. It, but it's really difficult to think of, a, of, a, of another problem that looks really like this. So we don't know where to put it because it really is, is not a, a no, only an issue of free riding. It's not only an issue of international cooperation. It's also not an issue in which we require everybody to, to do their part uh, so that we see an effect. Uh, so we don't know where to put a press, not because it is novel, it's because the characteristics makes it uh, very, uh, very unique. And that permeates through, all, through the whole process. So if we decide that um, we have uh, achieved a point, I don't know how, in which we all agree we're going to deploy this, the question of how is also complicated because unlike, unlike mitigation of CDR in which I agree, we cannot restore the climate, but we can actually undo the same climate force that cause the problem. So if we put mitigation and we take, if, sorry, if we put greenhouse gas emission, we take them away, we don't recover the same climate, but we are actually undoing the cause. But in here it looks different. So now we can say something like this. For the first time, I think, we can ask the question, what is your preferred climate? A country can say, my, te my preferred temperature is 20 degrees, and our country is gonna be 30 degrees. We were not able to ask that question before, because we couldn't get there, because mitigation only get us so far. But now we have a technique that actually says, if I want to do 20 and you want 30, it's not even my real temperature. If I see that my preferred temperature is not my current temperature, we can get there too. Um, so the technique itself, I think, is creating most of these challenges. And, and I think has to do with framing. And I think it's something that they said at the beginning, or maybe it was in the conversation, conversation before the talk, that framing matters a lot. So we have thought of about solar geoengineering and this monolithic uh, technique. We said we can put this sulfur in the stratosphere and, and cool down the planet, for example. But what if we stop thinking about it like that? 
So a technology is a technology, the way we use it is different than the technology itself. So we could think of, for example, geoengineering being deployed for a little bit, like we said, half a degree Celsius. That makes the governance problems different. And if the answer is yet, yeah, relative to let's say two and a half degrees Celsius. If, they, if there are differences in governance problems depending on the magnitude of the technology, that makes it very difficult to govern as well. Because we will say like, we want to encourage you to do a little bit, but not that much. That's, that's very complicated. So I'm just saying all the many ways in which this actually is a very difficult problem without offering any solution at all. <laughs> Can I add to that just yeah. very briefly? Yeah. So, I, I agree. And, and, and I think that the framing is so important. And we, we often focus on this because we've been doing this from a climate perspective, uh, climate change perspective, sorry. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, I spoke to somebody from a senior official from a country from the Sahel, who said, what, you mean this stuff could actually increase rainfall? I'm interested, <laughs> you know? So, you know, let's, let's th th this is not just simply uh, uh, solar geoengineering to fix the climate uh, in terms of reducing the problem of the climate crisis, but some people, some stakeholders could be simply very interested for agriculture, for health, or other reasons. Yeah. So, and the same way, as we discussed earlier, there will be some who will have opposing feelings about it for yet other reasons. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's complicated, it is messy. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Um, uh, I think I'm gonna go now to one of the, the PhD candidates we have in the Balsley School, Nisar Chata. Nisar, I've unmuted you and feel free to ask your questions. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, uh, Janice, uh, thank you very much for a very informative presentation. And I will be very careful not to use the term climate geoengineering. Neil Craig doesn't like this, and he always advocates separate CDR and SRM. <laughs> so, uh, my first question, like your last point, is that. Uh, you have a paper uh, from C to G2 on sustainable development impacts of climate geoengineering or CDR SRM. So have you, and your slide 15 is that you are in discussion or you will be in discussion with various United Nations agencies to have some of, uh, assume some of the roles you are doing uh, about it. So have you ever considered that uh, CDR or SRM as a attainment for sustainable development goals. The paper is about impacts of climate geoengineering on SDGs. But if some of the developing countries, because of climate change, are not able to meet their SDGs, will they be able to deploy these technologies to attain uh, their goals. Have you considered, or in discussion with United Nations Development Program, to consider this uh, uh, technology for the capacity building to meet some of their goals? Like you said, some of the countries are interested for rainfall, but they may have their own specific climate change issues. And my second question is that, how do you see role of China? Because China has done uh, an exclusive uh, program in Beijing Normal University research program on climate geoengineering. So how China within United Nations or outside United Nations or UNFC will be able to shape this regime in uh, coming uh, years? That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very interesting question. So the first one, uh, well, uh, our, the paper which we did, by the way, which is also another paper that we, we are re, re uh, revising uh, currently, and we're doing it in a way that it can be peer reviewed. Uh, so hopefully it will be included in the IPCC uh, uh, assessments also. Uh, so there will be a new version of that paper, actually two, two versions, one on CDR, one on SRM, just to be clearly separated in the two. But what the original paper al already showed is that there are clearly uh, benefits as well as um, negative risks of these different approaches on certain SDGs. And one needs to be specific. And in fact, we also identified there's quite a lot of research that still needs to be done to understand better what those uh, negative and maybe positive impacts are. So 
uh, I think it's pretty clear when it comes to nature-based approaches, that's where the most obvious benefits uh, come forward because when you plant a forest, then of course there are many other benefits uh, that are there in addition to potentially uh, uh, storing some of the carbon. Uh, at the same time, I think it's also pretty clear that nature-based solutions, uh, nature-based approaches are not necessarily your silver bullet solution that will solve everything because it has its own challenges as well. So in every case, there are benefits and, 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 uh, and risks. So we have not been uh, advocating with UNDP and others. We have been having discussions with UNDP, but we have not been advocating for any particular solution because we don't think that's our role. Uh, I think there are others who are doing it already, and they, they, and that's fine. You know, that's 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 their uh, purpose. But uh, it, we have not felt that it was our role. In fact, it it would be against our impartiality vis-a-vis -vis some of these technologies to actually advocate for any particular set of solutions. But we do draw attention to the fact that there are positive and negative impacts. They need to be understood, and then, of course, based on that countries need to make sometimes complex decisions, which of course ultimately will be political, but hopefully there will be uh, this kind of science input. On your second question, the role of China. So, uh, you know, it's it's almost goes without saying that whatever China does or doesn't do will have the biggest impact <laughs> uh, on, on, on these kinds of issues. So, uh, uh, I have been personally very much involved in, in developments in, in China over the last two years. Uh, um, in, in various ways, so a lot of direct discussion with the Ministry of Ecology and the Environment, as well as uh, being involved in the uh, so-called China Council for uh, International Cooperation and Environment and Development, with a simple idea, and we just kept on coming, and we will continue to keep uh, engaging with uh, 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 officials that at some point, they need to address in a serious way, like everybody else, the issue of carbon dioxide removal and also solar radiation modification. And now that China has just uh, 10 days ago announced its 2060 goal, that becomes suddenly <laughs> absolutely more relevant, that discussion, because it is pretty clear that they will need to do quite a bit on that. Now, they've done a lot on nature-based approaches. They were the co-lead of that topic during the Secretary UN Secretary General Summit last year. Uh, we also engaged with uh, China to the highest level on that particular topic uh, uh, and so on. So, um, so this is, this is uh, clear there. Now, what they have done in the Beijing Normal University is a very nice set of research activities, mostly on uh, modeling of the impacts of uh, solar radiation modification, both globally and also regionally. Uh, in, the, in the Himalayas, in the Chinese, China, and, and so on and so forth. So that's very useful scientific information for the overall knowledge base. And uh, but at the same time, they've been very uh, much pushing the concept of science-based approaches uh, within uh, within China. So how where that's going to lead us, uh, we don't know yet. Uh, obviously not, uh, but. Uh, but uh, these are the, the different elements that, that maybe I can contribute to, to your questions. Juan, did you want to add anything there? Or? No, I think in this case, I was just learning a lot. <laughs> okay, great. I'm going to go to Lyndon Barton, who's got a question as well about the IPCC. Lyndon, do you want to join us there? Sure, thank you. Can you hear me? Yep, great. Thanks. Um, so I'm curious for your views on the fact that the IPCC considers carbon removals to be part of mitigation. Should countries be encouraged to have separate targets for emission reductions and removals? Is the balance between these important, or is it helpful to, to give countries the flexibility in meeting their targets using the approaches that work for them? Thank you. Interesting question. So first of all, it is, it is not my or our role to, to say what countries should do, but I can say a few words about this uh, in the sense that one has to be absolutely clear that there's one thing, the same technology, the same technique can help us to literally offset current emissions, which in some cases we will need to do for some time to come because they are difficult uh, areas like cement production, for example, or some of the transport. It's difficult to 
quickly reduce the emissions. So in those cases, we need some techniques to reduce, help to reduce our emissions and offset them. But then there's also the absolute reduction of carbon from the atmosphere that is needed. Uh, already, if we stop all emissions today, we know that there's already too much carbon in the atmosphere. So we will have to remove some of the carbon. Uh, the only question is how much more we're going to put in there <laughs> that we will have to remove. So in, in that context, it's very important to separate the two. One is about offsetting emission, and the other is absolute removal of carbon. Now, if you mix them all together into one goal, then it's not clear what you're doing. And we just recently commissioned a paper, which is available on our website, which exactly addresses this issue uh, and, and, and argues that, in fact, it's very important for countries to have separate goals for offsetting and separate goals for removals. And then it's clear, and then there is no question about uh, what you're doing. So again, it's not up to us to tell countries what they should do, but at least we can be clear about what they mean and uh, what is the concept. And I can, you know, you can refer to this paper on our website uh, that uh, uh, argues in detail why uh, such separation is so important. Thank you. So, so let me add a, a couple of things. Um, the the idea of having different targets is also very useful because um, of the issue of accounting that Janos mentioned earlier. Like we don't know what which emissions are we actually removing. So if I remove emission from the atmosphere and somebody else is is uh, reducing emissions with traditional forms of mitigation, we don't know really how to account for this. So I think different, but but there is also a little bit of justice. Uh, the the answer to this involve. Uh, us to think about justice broadly. Um, suppose uh, I am Colombian, we are emitting carbon, uh, we are still not fully developed as a country in terms of compared, let's say, to the US or anywhere, somewhere else. Um, so there are two issues of, of justice. The first question is, should we actually be reducing emissions at the same pace as developed countries? And, and if you think the answer is yes, then every, all countries need to be doing their effort starting right now. That is fine, but that involves a judgment call. If you said, no, we should let developing countries uh, develop, um, then you need richer countries to do a little bit more of removal than they would have done otherwise. And that has very different implications. The second issue of justice is the maximum that I can do as Colombia is to get my, my emissions to zero. But the emissions of Colombia are not the main contributor to climate. So even if I get my emissions to zero, I'm not going to have a large effect on the climate, but I am going to be receiving the, the damages caused by climate. So now there are other countries that could actually say, okay, we're going to take a emissions away or concentrate, we're going to reduce concentrations, absolute removal from the one so that they can compensate for the previous impacts on the climate. So I think the idea of separating um, is not only an accounting, is not only uh, an issue of, of how easy or difficult it is to, to measure them or the type of technology. I think justice is involved, the fact that historically some countries have contributed more than maybe they should have uh, more to do with uh, restoring I don't personally know, but <laughs> removing uh, carbon uh, from, from the atmosphere. Uh, now, in terms of negotiations, this is the last thing I'm going to say. I think there is a, more countries are going to be willing to participate if they have flexibility on how to achieve certain targets. So obviously, there are always trade-offs, and I think uh, forcing countries to separate the accounting between emissions and negative emissions might make them let light, less likely to participate in into achieving a particular target. Uh, but just in general, we just need to think of intergenerational justice and inter-regional justice when we make this, this judgment calls. Thanks, Juan. Maybe I'll just uh, jump in here as, as, as well, because I think uh, this is something that, that I've thought and written a little bit about in uh, particularly as it relates to the, the, the Paris Agreement and, and how we actually represent uh, nationally determined contributions. And it seems to me one of the challenges here and, and what we're beginning to see is a number of countries identify 
um, CDR and removals, at least in their sort of long-term um, plans around, around climate change. But what we don't know, of course, is how feasible large-scale CDR is, and we don't know how uh, socially acceptable it is. We don't know its impacts on things like food security, on water and energy. So there's all sorts of um, unanswered questions. And one of the risks I think we run is countries relying on an optimistic view of the acceptability of CDR and therefore um, putting less mitigation in their, CD, uh, in their naturally, um, deter nationally determined contributions um, with the possible result if the CDR doesn't manifest that we end up with some overshoot. And I think we have to be very wary about the degree to which and how countries are relying on unproven technologies in CDR and the extent that they can do that um, without ponying up with mitigation um, because ultimately it, it may look like we're going to achieve two degrees or 1.5 degrees, but it's all premised on the idea that these technologies will manifest themselves in the second part of the century, which they may not do, which again, I think just pr probably reinforces um, both the views from, from, from Yanis and uh, Juan that we need to really start thinking about how to separate these things out in terms of reporting and in terms of, of, of NDCs. Uh, in, in the future. Um, I'm, I'm going to turn to uh, Richard LaBelle. And uh, Richard, um, you have a question uh, around, uh, and I think it's a, a great question around public opinion. Uh, I, I think you're able to, to, to go ahead, Richard. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Neil. Um, uh, uh, yes, uh, so uh, my question has to do with uh, awareness promotion and in uh, the matter of SRM. Uh, I know John Janos, uh, we've worked together in the past and we've discussed around this to some extent. Um, one of the key issues in my mind, given the governance model that's being proposed, which is a, a multi-staker model, which, which of course is the, is, is, is the only way forward really, um, to what extent um, has C2G been looking at uh, um, supporting greater awareness or encouraging greater awareness, realizing that you're not an advocacy organization? It, it seems to me that this institutional framework will only work if it has really strong public support in one fashion or another, including sectoral support, not the least from the private sector and uh, uh, from NGOs, uh, civil society, generally speaking. So uh, it, it's just a general question about how um, the message is going to be transmitted. Um, uh, also, because uh, most recently I've been working in Africa, I work in international development, and this is, I think, a, an issue in particular to certain developing countries who may not be that familiar with um, the question of SRM and how it could be important in reducing global warming. So what, what thought has been put into this question of, you know, how do we get public support for this uh, now quite important uh, methodology endeavor, uh, uh, and as well as engagement from the, from the international uh, agencies and so on. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Richard. And, and first of all, let, let me say that I agree with you that uh, uh, public support, uh, uh, social license for deciding to go ahead or not go ahead <laughs> with these uh, approaches is absolutely essential. Uh, and, uh, and of course that public support and that social license will come through in very different ways in different societies. We don't need to get into the detail of that, but clearly it will be very different in Canada or in Switzerland or in China or in, uh, in Ghana. So, uh, but that's okay. Now, uh, but the question you had, what had we done about it? And uh, basically our approach has been that our target audience that we selected for our work is very clearly uh, decision makers and their advisors in governments and in key non-state actors, be they local governments or civil society or even private sector entities. Uh, we have taken a specific decision that we will not engage actively in broader public awareness raising because that requires a whole set of of different inputs, uh, uh, different uh, expertise and so on. So we've taken a decision not to do that. But what we try to do is, because we, we recognize the importance of that, is to try to engage in a catalytic way with others whose job it is to do that. 
<laughs> so uh, to the extent possible, we try to work with entities that, that actually are much better at, at reaching out to the, to, the, to the broader public. That doesn't mean we don't do anything at all in this area. We do some things and uh, some of the activities we do, some of the online activities we've done, they actually do reach the broader public, some of the media activities we've undertaken, but that's not our focus. Okay, that's so, so that's uh, uh, very simple. Now, one thing that has developed as a result of COVID, <laughs> and I suppose we're in the same situation as everybody else, is that we're kind of stuck. We, we can't travel, we can't go to uh, conferences and so on. So we have increased our online offerings. We have a whole series of activities that we started off a, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, uh, some of you are uh, well, uh, I think Juan, you're involved in one of these as a, an expert, and, and so we've engaged some 50 experts worldwide who are involved in various webinars, campfire chats, and we're this we're just beginning a, a, what we call the C2G talk series, which will be individual interviews with, with people, a bit like hard talk, but maybe a bit softer, not so hard, but still focusing on, on, on these issues. And uh, of course, online activities, uh, when they're online, then they're open to everybody. So we're, we're reaching more than our typical target audience, and we're conscious of that, but we're still, we have decided uh, not to focus on that, but instead uh, leave, it, uh, leave it to others. Uh, and we hope that by focusing, because at this point, the policy people, as it was said at the beginning, I think, Neil, in your introduction, that very much the, the problem we faced when we started this initiative was that people in academia were talking about this, uh, but, but not in, uh, hardly anybody in the policy space. So let's get through that hurdle first, <laughs> is to, to, to at least we can take that on ourselves. So this is our part of the responsibility. Is let's work on those people, the decision makers and their advisors and key governmental and non-state actor entities. And if we can achieve that, that itself will generate a broader discussion, which will then eventually uh, result in the public support and the social license uh, that will be necessary, whether or not that process is there to stop or to actually make these things work. Okay. Uh, uh, Jan, I, I think we just got for, for, for one last question um, and then I'll give everyone a last minute Juan just to just okay. to just to wrap up so uh, Burgess uh, Langshaw if um, if we can un unmute him and we've just got a couple of minutes so a quick question and maybe a quick answer and then we'll maybe just do a little uh, one minute tour de table before we sign off so go ahead Burgess sure thank you um, so I guess my question is just around in terms of developing uh, policies. So is there any point in having any domestic policies, uh, particularly in, say, Canada or the United States, if there's no international agreements, then sort of enforcing those or, or supporting those? And if not, you know, if Canada did go ahead and develop some policies, would other nations actually follow suit? Or would this sort of end up being a little bit of an island saying, hey, we're doing something and everybody else would just sort of smile and nod politely? Well, that's a really interesting question, and, and I, I'm glad you, 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 you asked that uh, because uh, there are many, many sort of points that are relevant for this discussion in, in my view. So first of all, how do international agreements come about? Uh, most of the time, it comes because within countries, there are developments, ideas that come up, and whether they come because there were policies at the national level, just reflection by government officials, but it, it tends to be uh, driven from countries. It's sometimes it happens the other way also, that maybe there are things, developments happening in different countries, but then some international entity, if it exists, somehow then brings actors together and then something happens. But, you know, why did, why did the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change appear? It's not because some people got together in some room in, a, in the top of the UN building, but it's because countries brought it to the General Assembly and said, we need to do something, you know? So, so in that sense, I think it's very important for countries like Canada to have policies, have approaches on these issues. Deployment is a different story, but at least to have ideas about this 
so that they can then contribute to the international debate. Now, Canada in the past has often been very much a leading voice in helping to make things happen at the international level. So uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, if, if Canada can have such ideas, such policies, then, uh, then, then this can be very helpful. Now, one more point is that when countries have their domestic national approaches, it depends how they bring it to the international community. Because uh, put Canada aside for the moment, if any country were to decide, let's say a, a large country decides to do a unilateral approach on stratospheric aerosol injection, they, they announce that they're gonna do it. Uh, now, there are at least two major ways that this can happen. Uh, they announce it and then they, they may not say it like this is forget about everybody else we're going to do it we're going to use our technology we're going to implement it and the world will just have to live with our decision another way would be uh, a country announces that we're going to do it and the next day they call a meeting of the security council and say hey we need to discuss this at the international level how can we bring this together and and maybe uh, work this out so that we collectively uh, the nations uh, address this so that the, the initial unilateral decision is more like a kick in the system, you know, a, a constructive destruction of, of, of no action and, and then followed up with something where you bring the nations together. So there are different ways in which, now coming back to your question, if Canada has these policies and ideas, it depends how Canada makes use of them in the international sphere. Thank you. Thanks so much. So maybe I'll just uh, ask um, or give an opportunity to Juan and Yanis just to make any last, uh, last final uh, comments before we sign off. Uh, Juan, do you want to go ahead? Sure. Thank you. And thank you again for having me. This has been uh, really fun. Thank you for the good questions. Um, I'm going to use this time just like to, to give a shout out to, uh, to an organization that has actually tried to increase uh, capacity in the developing countries. I, I say this as a response to, to Richard Lavelle's question of public opinion. It's not public opinion, but uh, we, I, when we talk that, when we said that uh, the only people working on this have been academics, we mean academics in rich countries and among rich countries, very few. Uh, so uh, there is this international organization called the SRM, Governance Initiative. Um, we think which there is a program that is called Decimals, D-E-C-I-M-A-L-S. And, and you can look at that. Uh, but they, they, they are, they are, the idea is to actually bring expertise to developing countries so that the developing countries can actually de develop their own questions, their own research, and be more familiar with the concept of solar geoengineering so that they can bring it to the international arena from their perspective and not relying on the research made by, by others. So I, I, just to point out that this last two question actually linked to that, we need to develop capacity. We need to be very careful about the way we develop that capacity so that we are not uh, imperialistic uh, in terms of academia, but, uh, but the effort is there and, and I think we need to keep doing that. We need to increase capacity at the international level. We need to involve different voices. But if they are not familiar with your engineering, they're not gonna be able to say anything. So we need to involve them. And, and, the, and the work uh, that CTG is doing is really important in that regard as well. Because science is, needs to be demanded by society we don't just say as, as academics or scientists, we're gonna say, oh, we want to research on this. That is useless unless somebody wants that research. And it has to start somewhere. So when politicians or, or, or the directorate at some level actually are aware of this, then they start to think, okay, what do we need this for? And that creates demand, so a social demand for whatever research we're doing. So it kind of places all our endeavor into a more, um, transparent I think, uh, framing. And so the work of uh, SRMGI and the work of CTG is really fantastic for what we're doing here. Thanks so, so much, Juan. Yanis, any last uh, last words? It's, it's, it's hard to, to say, but, but I think maybe I'll, I'll just say one thing here, that 
connecting to what was said at the beginning. So we are in deep, deep crisis situation on climate change. And uh, uh, what I'm afraid of is that uh, the world is not reducing the emissions enough. And, uh, and we're, I say, procrastinating about carbon dioxide removal. We've been talking about elements of it, like carbon capture and storage for years. <laughs> and and the, it, it, things are not advancing fast enough. And, and what, what I'm afraid of is that uh, the, the world will end up in a cul-de-sac where the only option left is a quick uh, stratospheric aerosol injection to bring the temperatures down. And I don't think that's a, a very desirable scenario. Uh, partly because there are some big questions about SRM itself, but also if it's, if it's this kind of last resort solution, then cut, corners will be cut, decisions will be made quickly, and, and that's not a very, very desirable future. Uh, so I, I think we need, we need to uh, increase uh, our engagement, our discussions about these issues and look at the different aspects, bring in the, uh, much more seriously the, the Global South in the discussions uh, to hear their views and their, their assessments of their needs and their desires. And then uh, hopefully we will avoid that kind of uh, uh, crisis scenario. Uh, that does wake me up at night sometimes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, Deb, any, any last words? Just a big thank you to our speakers and all the, the great questions. And I would say that the kind of discussion that we had here today helps to further your aims about trying to get people to talk about this. Because I really noted that in a few of the questions, people said, I don't know that much about these technologies or these issues. And I, so I think today really served to kind of bring some of those issues out. So thank you very much to both of you. Thank you for having us. And let me add, add, add my thanks. I think uh, this uh, has been a really uh, terrific discussion and it's been really interesting. I've been following and, and participating a little bit in these debates for five or seven years. And there's really been a, a, a dramatic shift in this short period of time where the discussion on on different aspects of climate engineering, you know, has moved from the periphery and and is much more moving um, to the center. And I think this is a really crucial time because uh, you know there has been a lot of taboo uh, around talking about some of these issues and uh, and and how they're being framed and and thought about. And I think one of the things that uh, Yanish and, and 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 your team have really done. Is, is moved beyond, I think, a kind of endless discussion around framing and, and this and that, and just try to really get us thinking seriously uh, about this issue in the broader context of, of, of climate change. And so I think it's been a really uh, great discussion. And thank you for everyone who uh, showed up and participated today. And we'll look forward to seeing you at our, at our next session where we'll be talking with Damon Matthews, one of Canada's top uh, climate modelers. And we're gonna be talking about a, a, a similar topic, which is really, you know, what happens if we don't meet these targets and what does Canada look like in a very, in, in, in a very warm world? Um, so, which of course uh, brings us back to some of our discussions. Uh, today. So uh, again, uh, a big thank you to everyone. And we look forward, hopefully, to having Yanis up here in person when all this craziness uh, ends. So bye for now. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, bye now. Thank you.